Now, where we left off with lecture 1.1 was the discussion of the peripheral as well as the central lymphatic systems. Central, it'll be, as you see here, everything in or located near the trunk, the primary. <coughs> this is going to be the majority, the major lymphatic system here. Everything will drain from the legs, the arms, the head, towards the trunk, but will pass through these clusters of lymphatic nodes. As it passes through these lymphatic nodes, Antigens will be presented by the dendritic cells, also known as APCs or antigen presenting cells, will go literally B cell by B cell, T cell by T cell, macrophage by macrophage, showing what it has located. Something, an antigen that is not you, is not self. Now, the innate system, as I said, this is the first to encounter anything not you. The first true line of defense is your skin, your mucosal tissues. Anything that can get through this barrier, first thing it'll run into is the innate system. There will be the macrophages that are swimming through your tissues, not swimming through your blood, but literally swimming through your tissues, your muscle, your underlying skin tissues, all the integuments. They are swimming through looking for anything that is not you. Once they come into contact with something not you, they will release cytokines and chemokines. Remember I've mentioned these before. Cytokines are signal flares. They're kind of like here, 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 come here, come here. You will activate, you will activate, you will activate. Chemokines, well, think of this as leaving breadcrumbs. All the other cells will follow the breadcrumbs to where that macrophage is so that they now know where the, the infection is taking place. Any cells that come into contact with these cytokines or these chemokines will begin expressing new genes. They will take on a new appearance. They will start taking on new activities. These activities we bundle under what is referred to as inflammation. You see this whenever you get a cut, a scrape, an insect bite. It gets red. It gets warm. It swells up. That is inflammation. The localized cells amp up their cellular metabolism to try to increase the localized temperature. Most bacteria that infect us do not like our body temperature and above, so by having that little thermostat go up in that area, they're trying to burn out the bacteria in a way. By having the tissue swell with more fluid, it allows for easier entry by more macrophages, by T cells, and all of the other cells that are coming to clear out the site of infection. We also get complement. Complement, as we'll see in a later chapter, are a series of serum proteins that will bind to anything not you and then begin punching holes in it. If it punches holes in it enough, what was inside that infecting cell will now leak out. As more of that stuff leaks out, that cell dies, but the contents that leaked out will now activate more macrophages. We see here um, how cells that are in the tissues, macrophage comes in contact with the bacteria. Maybe you got a cut, a scrape, whatever. The macrophage, once it binds to this and starts to phagocytize, will send out cytokines and chemokines. These will activate, these will attract other cells, as they're showing here. These cells will then squeeze through the cells lining, the epithelial cells lining the bloodstream. Here, where they're tightly bound together, here it shows that they are now loose. They become loose and allowing fluid to seep out. The tissues swell. This is an 
in response to inflammation. This leaking and this now gaps between the cells will allow other white blood cells to push through and to come in and help the macrophage clear out the site of an or, you know, alongside of PAMP binding a PRP. We find these um, specifically in the white blood cells in the innate immune response. I'm sorry, the adaptive immune response. When you look at, you know, the clonal expansion. Uh, remember in the last lecture I said one B cell will get turned on, will get activated, well one becomes two, four, eight, sixteen, and so forth. That is the clonal expansion. Each of those new cells is an exact clone, an exact copy of the first. Well you do not want to sit there and have that happening willy-nilly because that's when you end up with, you know, certain types of cancer. So you have to have a secondary switch that will be triggered at the same time as the primary switch. This will sit there and tell the cells, yes, this is actually needed. Or if it's not switched on, no, this is just a holdover from something else. We don't really need this right now. This allows us to have what we see nowadays um, in a nutshell out in your tissues you just had a cut you've got something into your skin maybe you know a cut inside your mouth macrophages are dendritic cells here they're showing dendritic cells swimming through the tissues come into contact with something that is not you a macrophage would pass it on to a dendritic cell or if a dendritic cell gets it, it then swims, literally does swim through the tissues in between cells and between tissue layers to the draining lymphatic system. It will then swim up the lymphatic ducts to the nearest lymph node. They refer to this as migration. Once there, the dendritic cell will literally go B cell by B cell, T cell by T cell, showing everybody what it has. The binding of the dendritic Whatever it, it picked up to the T cell will be the initial signal. If they bind and everything's hunky dory, the T cell no, recognizes whatever was picked up by the dendritic cell. The, T, the dendritic cell will then give it the secondary signal to activate. And we'll talk more about that in later chapters. Now, when you look at clonal expansion, um, this is uh, the idea of this has been around for a few decades. Uh, Gowen and later Owen looked at this and they found it as a way for the B cells that come about to learn tolerance. Has to tolerate self. Start off with that progenitor cell. The progenitor cell will make copies of it through mitosis. Now each of these copies will be slightly different. As you noticed here, the artist drew them with slightly different shading of colors. Where these differences are gonna be is in the B cell receptor. Each of the B cells, as you see here, the receptor has a slightly different shape. Thus, it's gonna re recognize a slightly different antigen. These immature cells that are still in the bone marrow will be exposed to all different types of self antigens. Anything that recognizes self, the self antigen binds the receptors, will immediately be killed. Clonal deletions. So anything that recognizes self does not live long. This is how we get the tolerance. Why it is extremely rare that people make antibodies to themselves. Why T cells do not respond to self. They do not live through the first, through first few steps of maturation. Those that survive this will then flow through the bloodstream. They will collect in different lymph nodes where different dendritic cells, different macrophages will present different types of antigens to them. And once is recognized here, the 
what was immature that became the naive and the lymph node will now fully mature and go through multiple, multiple rounds of mitosis, each cell going through making an exact genetically identical copy. So what started off as one can now be dozens. These lymphocytes that are now completely immature are still learning. They're considered immature when they're still in the bone marrow and they're learning self and non-self. Once they've left, they enter the bloodstream and then we'll go and travel to the lymph nodes or somewhere in the lymphatic system. They're now considered naive. Once they have then been presented with a true antigen that is not self that they will now recognize and they begin going through clonal expansion, they are now referred to as effector cells or mature cells. Now, one of the things that they've looked at and they've tried to use as an explanation is why we would see this has to go with the fact that each lymphocyte initially bears a single type of receptor with a unique specificity. As they trace it through the bloodstream, they begin to see that it will act, interact with different foreign molecules, different receptors. Some will live, some will not. Those that do not, when they capture them as they are dying through a, via apoptosis, remember apoptosis is a type of cell suicide, that these cells call for a receptor that happens to recognize some self antigen. Now, these mature cells, these B cells, Once they become effector cells, once they become plasma cells, they will begin producing what are known as antibodies. This Y-shaped thing you see here is a complex of proteins referred to as an antibody. The antibodies have, always will have two regions, constant, which you see down here in the light blue. Um, there's different classes, different types of antibodies. Each of the different types, each of the different classes will have this shape right down here, this Y and these blue areas in, they will always have these then the same shape, same structure. What's variable is up here in this lighter orangish shade. These are what are known as the variable regions. This right here, since this is a protein, the three dimensional structure of this will be variable uh, B cell to B cell because this is actually what will bind to and interact with the antigen itself. Now, you'll also see in the textbooks, okay, so they'll talk constant, which is down here at the base of the Y, and the variable, which is at the tips of the Y. They will also talk heavy chain. Notice the green here goes up from the constant all the way through to the variable, and then the light chain, the little yellow here that attaches to the arms of the heavy chain. So you have to pay attention when you're reading primary literature and they're talking about variable region, the, you know, they may say um, variable region versus the constant region and I'll say F subscript C, F constant, that's the base here of the Y. The variable region is up here at the tips. They may say heavy chain or they may say light chain. Now, one of the interesting things about the antibody shape is it is highly conserved um, throughout all immune systems, not only mammalian, but we see it in all animal systems. You see here on the left, an IgG molecule, um, Ig, immunoglobulin, G is the different class, IgA, IgG, IgGD, and so on. But if you notice, these shapes appear, part of a constant, part variable. This also has 
relatively the same shape and the same genetic structure as what we would see with the T-cell receptor we talked about in lecture 1.1. Because they have these areas, these protein areas, they refer to them as domains, because they have these domains in con uh, that are conserved, they refer to this as an immunoglobulin domain. This is an immunoglobulin domain that, that forms a T-cell receptor. Here are two immunoglobulin domains that form an antibody. When you look at it, the immunoglobulin, the antibody itself, the antibody itself does not bind to a bacteria, it does not bind to a virus. What it does is it binds to a part of a protein on the surface of the bacteria or part of the protein on the surface of a virus. It binds to, and you see here this red antibody, the variable region here binds to because it recognizes it can bind to the overall topical shape of these two loops. They form the correct shape that binds into the grooves of this variable region. Whereas the blue antibody here from a different B cell, its variable region is shaped such that it can bind to the topographical shape of these three loops that have to be in this close proximity. This protein gets denatured. These antibodies cannot bind because the loops being in such arrangement will be lost. So antibodies bind, antigens are parts, or the antigen they recognize is the epitope, the overall surface shapes on the surface of an antigen, which is on the surface of a bacteria or a virus. And in the next lecture, we will talk about how these will be presented via MHC molecules to B cells and T cells.